So we're going to move to the last part of the reading that was assigned for Locke, and this is that section on knowledge. So after going through all the different things that we've gone through on Locke, this is going to tie in actually most closely with where we started with Locke, which is empiricism. Um, and we look at section one under book four, chapter nine. Um, it, this is exactly where it picks up, is that knowledge only comes through sensation. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. He thinks that we have some kind of immediate and a direct awareness of our own self that is not through experience. And he also has this interesting kind of proof for the existence of God that he thinks doesn't depend on experience. We're not going to worry about those two things. If you want to read about his argument for the existence of God, you can just go back and read pages... Uh, Uh, yeah, 405 to 410. 405 to 411, right before all this, if you want. Um, for those of you that have studied some of this before, it's essentially another version of a cosmological argument for the existence of God. But let's focus on the other stuff. Everything else besides knowledge of oneself and, one, and knowledge of God. So, he thinks that all knowledge, anything that we can say you know has to be associated with or originate from experience. And the way that he, I think the intuitive idea behind this is that if one acquired ideas apart from sensation, it would not count as knowledge because there's no causal link between the ideas and the real object that's out there in the world. So why is it that you can say that you know, according to Locke, you can know that this is a water bottle? because you're having certain sensations right now, and those sensations are produced by the water bottle. But here's kind of a weird case. Suppose right now, um, the president, let's say, is in New York City. And you just happen to form the belief the president is in New York City. And let's say you're not following the news, you don't keep up with these things, it just sort of strikes you as you're like, you know, eating a sandwich or something. You're like, you know what? I believe the president's in New York City. And if the president is, in fact, in New York City, most people aren't going to say that you know that the president is in New York City. You got lucky. Why? Because we think there's no causal link between your belief and what makes that belief true, what the belief is about. Sensation gives us that connection, according to law. It's the fact that you're having those sensations about the water bottle or about the person sitting next to you or whatever it is that connects your ideas, your beliefs, with reality. The other really cool thing about Locke's view is that knowledge, unlike maybe Descartes, knowledge does not require absolute certainty. I do want to read section 2 here. So open up to page 411. Um, let's take a look on the right column. I'm going to read all of section 2 because it's kind of short. Um, he says, It is therefore the actual receiving of ideas from without that gives us notice of the existence of other things and makes us know that something does exist at the time without us, which causes that idea in us though perhaps we neither know nor consider how does it. For it does not take away from the certainty of our senses and the ideas we receive by them that we do not know the manner in which they are produced. While I write this, I have by the paper affecting my eyes that idea produced in my mind which whatever object causes I call white. And by this I know that the quality or accident whose appearance before my eye always causes that idea, does really exist and has a being without me. And of this, the greatest assurance I can possibly have, and to which my faculties can attain, is the testimony of my eyes, which are the proper and sole judges of this thing, whose testimony I have reason to rely on, so, as so certain that I can no more doubt while I write this, that I see white and black, and that something really exists and that causes that sensation in me, than that I write or move my hand, which is a certainty as great as human nature is capable of. So, 
Knowledge does not require absolute certainty. He thinks that you can know, for instance, that there is this water bottle in front of you, even though it's possible in some far-fetched way that there is no water, water bottle here. Maybe it's a hologram. Maybe you're dreaming. Maybe an evil demon is torturing your mind. All those things are possible, but Locke says you don't need to have that. All that you need to have is this kind of assurance from, and he uses this word testimony from your senses. If you're in a courtroom and you get testimony about some event that took place, you weren't there, somebody else kind of informs you of it. In a way, that's kind of what Locke says about your, your senses. You're, you don't get to have direct access to the way the world is. But you've got these sort of testimonies that you're constantly getting from your five senses that are constantly testifying to how the way the world is. And he thinks that we should have a kind of maybe prima facie trust of those, te of those sensory faculties. Have we used this phrase prima facie in here before? So it's kind, of, it's kind of a legal term. It literally in Latin means first face. The idea behind it is that it is innocent until proven guilty. So you should trust your senses until you have good reason not to trust them. Descartes took the other approach. Descartes said, don't trust your senses until they give you a reason to trust them. So if you think that your senses can be trusted without having any other reason to trust them besides you've got them, then you, you can generate knowledge out of them a lot, more, a lot more quickly. Now he's got more to say about why we should trust the senses, but he thinks that we should have this kind of initial trust in what our senses tell us. And that's what we're going to go on to talk about now, is that he gives us four reasons to trust our sensory faculties. And these are given in sections four, five, six, and seven. So in section four, he talks about how our sensory faculties are the only source we have for external things. Um, and in there, he's, he brings up things like the taste of a pineapple. If you had within your mind the, already the sensation of what it was like to taste a pineapple, then you wouldn't need to have come into contact with an actual pineapple to produce that taste. But nobody thinks that like the idea of what it's like to taste a pineapple is inside like your tongue, and that just contact with the pineapple unlocks that sensation. So, the only way that we can learn what it's like for to get the taste of a pineapple is to go out and make contact with that thing. Um, so in other words, our sensory faculties do not produce ideas all by themselves, all alone. Um, otherwise, we could produce any idea apart from a particular object's causes. But we don't think for somebody that's never tasted pineapple, we don't think that if they just use their imagination really well, they could conjure up the idea of what a pineapple tastes like. Or if you've never seen the color red, we don't think that if you just really use your imagination thoroughly, you could come up with what it's like to see the color red. You only get those ideas through sensation. The second reason that he gives is that our sensory faculties produce these ideas in us involuntarily. Now this is an idea that is kind of, t if you can remember way back to Descartes in the Sixth Meditation, this is something Descartes does kind of bring up in a way. So he compares the difference between daydreams and memories with the experiences that you have presently. When you like daydream or you remember, you control what you believe. That you choose to recall that past experience. Or you choose to dream about, you know, sitting on a beach in Hawaii. But un unlike those things, right now, the experience that you're getting through your senses occurs against your will. You have no control over this. You might wish that instead of, you know, seeing me up here, that instead it could be, you know, somebody like, you know, Brad Pitt or 
um, you know, Angelina Jolie or somebody else cool. But instead, you're stuck with me. Um, you might wish that instead of me talking about John Locke right now, instead I was talking about something cool like Star Trek or chess. Um, you might you might wish that instead of seeing you know your book and your paper and your notes in front of you, that, you know that instead it was you know like strawberry pie or something delicious like that. So un instead, the experiences that you have come to you involuntarily. You don't get to control this stuff. That seems to imply that there is some reality independent of me that makes me have these ideas. Any questions about these first two of the four before moving on? So the third one is that um, the ideas that we, that we produce presently have a kind of vivid experience of pain and pleasure associated with them that isn't the case with memories. Like, if you can remember, like, a, a really painful experience you had. So, like, when I was six years old, I was riding my bike down the street, and I got hit by a car. And I can still remember that event pretty well. But when I think about that event, I don't feel the pain that I had when I got hit by a car. But right now, if I were hit by a car, I could not stop feeling the pain. So there is something more, the, the reality of our present experience is privileged in a way, he thinks. So the, maybe a better example is, can you remember the last time you had a headache? You might say, yeah, I can really remember. I remember the day, I remember what I was doing, and I can kind of remember one of those headaches that was like on the front, you know, or whatever, however you describe it. But do you go through the experience of feeling the headache all over again by remembering it? No. There's a different kind of realism or force that comes to ideas of the present compared to ideas of memories or daydreams. And the fourth thing is that each faculty can be used to confirm one another. So that what you, you can see... So if you want to know, is my book really here? According to Locke, if you really get skeptical, you can look at it, you can touch it, you can smell it, get really excited, you can taste it. The, all of your different senses confirm that the book is there. Um, so if you, if you were really concerned about something being a hologram, one way to be, to be to sort of raise your knowledge of that is to make sure you can double check. Don't just look at it, touch it. And so your senses give you several different independent lines of knowledge about what it exists out there. If, so in other words, if there wasn't a real world out there that was causing you to have these ideas, it would almost be like a miracle that you're getting independent confirmation from each one of your senses that reality is this way. If there was no real world and we were just being like tricked or something, you would think actually that your five senses, that, that your senses would give you different reports about the way the world is. But instead, you're getting one sort of harmonious picture from all of your sensory faculties. Any questions about these two? Yeah. What about like a simulated experience? No, we don't have anything like this technical, but the holograms you just said. Um, you could make a hologram in such a way where you would never be able to tell outside the fact that maybe you know it's a hologram that that's one. Are you thinking like, one, could you touch this hologram? Yeah. Could you, if it, we made holographic food, you could eat it yeah. and smell it? At what point would it not be, would you say that it's not real though? I mean, if you can do all those things with it, wouldn't it be real? Okay. <laughs> I mean, the holodeck on Star Trek, if I can go there, um, does kind of present these kinds of cases where, in one sense, they want to say it's not real, but it seems to be about as real as anything else. Okay. The only way in which it's not real, in those cases, you can't take it off the holodeck. But if we make, if we extend the holodeck further, it seems like it's real to me. Yeah. Sorry. You're okay. fine. I have a, a, for number three, mm -hmm. I'll go. the ideas produced, um, what if you could, like, 
you think of like an experience, like you said, like a, you were in a car accident or something. What if you think back to that and you get like anxiety from it just by thinking of it? Because that, yeah, w would that be the same as like the whole pain perception? Because you are getting anxious. You could like maybe think of the thoughts that you had, like the thoughts of fear. If you think back, if you can maybe recur the same, like the same thoughts occur, would, now, would that be plausible or? Locke would want to say you. That's a. In fact, you you will have to have some recall that's similar and might even involve psychological and, and other responses, but it won't be as vivid as it is when it's present. So, I mean, some of you, if you think about it, some of these cases, maybe when you start saying, you know, when I do think about it, I do feel a little bit of pain when I recall that headache or that accident or that event. That's okay. That's consistent with what he's saying. He's just saying it's not as vivid as it would be. I mean, sometimes we're going to see this when we talk about David Hume. Um, but I'll probably use the same example, but like if you really think about right now biting into like a really, really sour lemon, think about that sour lemon and just imagine taking a big bite out of it. Your mouth actually starts to water and pucker even a little bit at the thought of it. But it's still not like it would be if you actually did it. <laughs> yeah. Now this is one of my sort of favorite parts, not necessarily because I agree with it, but the way he kind of throws the smack down here on Descartes. Um, so one of the things that we should bring about is that according to Locke, I mean, he's not going to rule out the possibility that you're dreaming right now. So what does he have to say about that? Let's take a look at section 8. I'm going to read a little bit of it. Let's start on the bottom left on 413. And pay attention and think about what is Locke's concern, response to the concern that his account of knowledge does not meet the standard of absolute certainty that we could be dreaming. Alright, so he says, But yet if after all this anyone will be so skeptical as to distrust his senses and affirm that all we see and see, hear, feel, and taste, think, and do during our whole being is but the series and deluding appearances of a long dream of which there is no reality, and therefore will question the existence of all things or our knowledge of anything, I must desire him to consider that if all is a dream, then he does but dream that he makes the question. And so it does not matter that a waking man should answer him. But yet, if he pleases, he may dream that I make him this answer, that the certainty of things existing in rerum natura, real nature, when we have the testimony of our senses for it, is not only as great as our frame can attain to, but as our condition needs. Let me skip to the bottom of section A, go up about like seven lines. So he says, now thus, this evidence is as great as we can desire, being as certain to us as our pleasure or pain, happiness or misery, beyond which we have no concern, either of knowing or being. Such an assurance of the existence of things without us is sufficient to direct us in the attaining the good and avoiding the evil, which is caused by them. This is the important concern we have of being made acquainted with them. What is he saying about this concern you might be dreaming? What's his response to that possibility here? Yeah. Um, it's saying that in your dreams you can control anything that will happen. Like if you like, there's an absolute certain certainty of like, like you have complete control in in the dream state. I don't see him saying that. Although that is something we sometimes think about, like that might tell us that we're dreaming. Think about what I finished, especially right at the very end here. What is he saying about that? Sort of that what matters most is our pleasure and our pain, and that should be enough to have us act in accordance with certain ways and have us follow our senses. That our senses tell us everything we need to know for our purposes. Like, and so he connects us with like our pain, our pleasure, our happy, our misery. I mean, if this is just all one big dream, I mean, your whole life is one big dream, that still doesn't mean that like you're just going to throw it all away. Um, I mean, it still matters to you, you know, if you're going to be happy tomorrow or if you're going to be miserable tomorrow. 
Um, he doesn't think life is one giant dream, of course, but he wants to say if that's the way you want to go with this, that his response is more to say, we have been given the ability to know what we need to know. That essentially, he's thinking of God here, that God made us in such a way that we can know all the stuff we need to guide our lives. If you want more than that, then you're essentially asking God to have made you so to make you almost omniscient. He says, "Why you don't need to be like that. You just God has made you with everything you need to govern your life." This kind of goes back to the very first part of the reading from last, from two weeks ago, that Locke has this view that human beings are limited in what they can know, and he's very aware of that. So he's almost like saying, be aware of your limitations and understand that we can't know everything. And instead of trying to look, know more than we're capable of, be content with what we are capable of knowing. So while it is not absolutely certain, the knowledge is as great as we need it for human affairs. And he drives this home beautifully in section 10. And turn over to page 414. Um, and this is like, once again, his response to somebody like Descartes, where, and he's going to kind of call him some names here. So he says, by means of which yet we may observe how foolish and vain a thing it is for a man of a narrow knowledge, who having reason given him to judge of the different evidence and probability of things, and to be swayed accordingly, he says, how vain, I say, it is to expect demonstration and certainty in things not capable of it, and refuse assent to very rational propositions and act contrary to very plain and clear truths because they cannot be made out so evident as to surmount every the least, I will not say reason, but pretense of doubting. He, who in the ordinary affairs of life would admit of nothing, but direct plain demonstration would be sure of nothing in this world, but of perishing quickly. So in other words, if you had to be absolutely sure of everything to know it, well, then you can't know that the next drink you take is going to be you know, nourishing, or the next bite of food you eat is nourishing. For all you know, it could kill you, or it doesn't exist. It could be a hologram, or you could be in a drink. If you needed to know those things with certainty, before you acted on them, well, then you die before anything would happen. He thinks that it is vain and it is prideful for people to have Descartes' view that you have to know it without any room for doubt because Locke says, we're not made that way. This kind of knowledge is not capable of that sort of proof. To demand that I know it with certainty or else I won't know it at all, is to just set the bar way too high. It's to demand too much of something that can't give you that. It's like, if you've got a moped to get around on, and you say, I'm only going to take this thing if it will go 70 miles an hour. Well, you're not going to go anywhere on it because the moped can't do that. But that seems like, I mean, that misses the point. The moped wasn't designed to do that. Use it the way it's supposed to be used. Locke is saying, use your sensory faculties the way they're supposed to be used. If you're saying your sensory faculties have to give you certainty before you believe them, you're just asking for something that's unreasonable. You're, you're being foolish and prideful. So in section 9, that we is between the two readings I give, I just went over. He says that knowledge is only limited to one's sensations. So he's got this view that you can only know, with like a capital K, know, things that are presently before you. So you don't know that anyone else exists right now besides people that are presently before you in sensory experience. So even if you saw somebody earlier today and they're not in this room, Locke would say, Locke says that you have a high probability in, in, knowing, in believing that they exist, but you don't know that they exist. And 
And maybe this actually might map on to a lot of our intuitions, that if I were to say, right now, do you, if you drove up here today, do you know where your car is? You might say, I think it's where I left it, but you know, I don't know because maybe somebody stole it, or it got towed, or something like that. Um, and that's the kind of thing I think Locke has in mind. You know it when you've got that connection to it with your senses. But the minute that connection is broken off, you don't know it anymore. Now, this kind of raises an interesting question. Um, what would Locke say about watching people on live TV or through video chat? If I'm watching, let's say, the, the president give a speech on live TV, do you think Locke would say that I know it, or do you think he would be hesitant to grant me that? I don't know the, I mean, this is sort of a question for debate, so it's not a right answer to this. Um, what case would you want to make on Locke's behalf here, that you know it or you don't know it? Will? I'd say that you don't know it because you're only using certain senses, and you can't cross-check those senses, all of them. Because each sense has what they can mm -hmm. checks and balances, I think, according to Locke. We got two of them, though. I can see yeah. the president, I can hear him. Reach out. Touch it, which I think would be required for the being to know that. That could just be yeah. a hologram. Probably. Although I don't reach out and I don't think and touch any of y'all to confirm y'all are here. I could, but I don't. <laughs> yes. Uh, I would agree with uh, with Will because I think about like a green screen and how like a person can appear to be in Hawaii on the beach when they're really mm -hmm. next door to you, just in front of a screen that creates the optical illusion that they're farther away or in a different place than they actually are. There's technological trickery that we could always be concerned. It might say live in the corner, but how do I know it's really live? It might be pre-taped or something like that. Mm -hmm. If you're on FaceTime with somebody, do you know that they exist according to log, or is it the same thing, that there could be technological trickery, and so that doesn't put you in touch with them? Yeah? Well, I think that intersects a little bit different because you're actually talking to them back and forth, whereas if you're watching on the prison on TV, you're not conversing with them. He's not responding to you. So maybe there's a little bit more of that feedback, that kind of like what Will said. It's a little different, but a little more confidence in it. What about this? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I would say like if it was like a live link type of thing and you had like a stream of conversation, then it would be a real thing to know that person because it's kind of like them being there presently. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're understanding. What about if I looked at yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what, uh, what if you had a game, this is, a, this is a game like this, where you can input stuff, and it, it does that I mean, as soon as you do it. So uh, going by that argument that you have a, a direct input, that, that game exists then. <laughs> well, I was thinking, I don't know if this is what you had in mind. I was thinking about, uh, you know, these uh, games that you can play where you have groups of people are, yeah. like, playing them, and you can chat to one another while you're in the game. In other words, kind of like Call of Duty sort of like. Yeah, so in games like Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, many of these things, like, do you know those other people exist because of the chatting messages? Now, that fits more like what you're saying with, like, hey, there's interaction, but it's a lot less sensory, right? You don't see them, you don't hear them. I mean, it's like through, like, an avatar on the screen. I think Locke would say to that, no, you don't know they exist. But that's... So what's the difference in these cases? Here's another one. Suppose there's somebody out in the hall right now. We can't see them directly, but I get a big mirror and I put it there. Do you see them? In, do you know they exist on Locke's view if you see them in the mirror? They probably wouldn't know because it's just an optical illusion. You might be concerned that, once again, there's some kind of trickery, so maybe it's an optical illusion. What if, uh, you know, if you're cool with one mirror, what if I did it through two mirrors, right? So through two mirrors, we're able to see somebody around the corner. And then if you like that, three, four, how many mirrors could I put up till you'd say, okay, we're no longer able to know they exist? Or would you be fine as long as there, I mean, take as many mirrors as you like, it would work. I mean, you're still observing the light that is reflected off the person. It's the same. So you might f be more comfortable with the mirrors than you are with the technology for that reason, yeah. that there's it's literally the same light molecules, of the photons of light that connect you to them.
once, so this is one thing I'm trying to bring out through this, is that as much as we kind of like putting down certainty, like, you know, yeah, Descartes really was overreaching what he was capable of doing, here's the other problem, though. Once you dial it down, how do you draw those lines where you need to draw them? Um, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's going to be really hard to be principled about it and say, okay, it's good in this case and it's bad in that one. With Descartes, at least he's got a line in the, in, that you know if you've crossed it or not. Just gives you the unhappy result that you don't know a lot of things that you like to know. Um, any questions about what I'm doing with, with this or what Locke's view is? I think in a lot of ways Locke's view is very, in this respect, is very commonsensical, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have some difficulties or some interesting things to think about. So, if knowledge only pertains to present experiences, how do we know things about the past? Because we do want to say that we know, um, you know, that George Washington was the first president of the United States, or that we know that, you know, it's when I was six years old, I lived in Houston, Texas. How do I know those things? Well, Locke does want to say that you can know things through memory. And once again, you might think this betrays the spirit of what we just did. But he thinks maybe memory is like a kind of sensory experience, very similar to, you know, your immediate sensory experience. So he says in section 11, we have knowledge of the past existence of several things of which our senses having informed us, our memories still retain the ideas. And of this we are past all doubt so long as we remember well. But this knowledge also reaches no further than our senses have former, formerly assured us. So he wants to say because your senses once gave you knowledge of these things, as long as you can remember them well, then you can still you can still claim to have knowledge of that through memory. Now the key thing that I worry about with this is what does he mean by remember well? That seems to hide a lot in it. How do you remember well? When do you, can you tell the difference between when you remember well and remember poorly? If I'm thinking about my childhood friend. And I, rem and I really feel confident his dog's name was Sparky. And then the next day I'm like, wait, wait, it wasn't Sparky, it was, it was Parker. And then I worry about maybe it was just Park. You know, at first I thought I remembered well, but after I start thinking about it more, I become more and more doubtful about the whole thing. Is remembering well something we can ever be sure that we do? What does it mean? Under, can you tell when you actually do correctly remember anything? So the, I worry that he's trying to paint this picture of your memories. If you've got if you've got vivid memories of cases of knowledge that were informed by your senses, then as long as you remember those experiences well, you can still know it. But I'm not sure how we can really tell the difference between remembering well and remembering poorly. Wouldn't you, I guess, remember well if you are taking a test and if you put all the correct answers, you remember all the answers, and you're right, like, isn't that in the form of And have you ever taken a test that you thought you remembered well and that you didn't, and the teacher said you didn't? <laughs> so you might say, in fact, you remember well when it's correct, but the issue is, well, how do you know when you remember well when you don't? What would you say, like, they're the people that could, like, actually recount exact dates and, like, what they were wearing, like, yeah. right okay. down to everything, and, like, they said it's, like, these people are so rare, it's unbelievable. What would he say about that? Yeah, that's would a really... Would that be remembering well? I think he would say, <laughs> if it's connected to your, your senses in the right way, I think he would say yes. There was a really cool one I've shown in some of my classes that you can find. Um, BBC did it. There were clips of it on YouTube. I don't know if it's, so it's called The Boy with the Amazing Brain. And it talked about this guy. He, like, memorized pi out to, like, the... I forget how many decimal. Like, it took him all day to say it. So it was, like, something like... It was out to, like, a 
100,000 digits or something. Um, and, and with pi, as you might know, is a non-repeating number, so it's not even like it, there's like a pattern or something to it. Um, and there's in this video they talk about another guy who can remember the the weather every day of his life, <laughs> yeah. and since he was like six years old. Both of these guys had like you know head injuries, which is interesting <laughs> too, that may have given them this ability. Well, maybe maybe blocks implying that everyone has a different standard of remembering the weather. So all different people and their standard of time, each experience is different. Possibly. I think one of the concerns I have about going that route, though, is that then, it, just depending on your own standard, you might be easier, you could get knowledge easier than me. That doesn't seem right to me. Like <laughs> get knowledge easier than me. Yeah. <laughs> You've got low enough standards, uh, you can get to the, you can have it remember well easier. What I'm even worried about, though, it, It seems like remembering well is not something you can just tell from self-reflection. So whether you remember well or not isn't just something you're able to just tell by thinking about, how did I do that time? Um, whether you remembered well or poorly is something you have no perspective on. Um, just got a couple more things and then we're done with Locke. So one of the, the other things that he talks about near the end here is that by his standards, we cannot say that we know anything about spirits besides God and for reasons that have nothing that have to do with, with some other things. So sort of forget God for the moment. But like so Locke is a Christian. He believes in angels and demons. But he doesn't say that he knows that angels and demons exist. Why is that? Because he's never experienced one. Since you can't have a, an experience of, at least most of us don't have experiences of angels or demons, we can't, in his view, know that they exist. We can't. Um, and what he would also say is, is that we have evidence from Revelation, from the Bible, that these things exist. But he wouldn't call that knowledge. He would say that that just makes it very probable that they exist. For him to know it would once again require the ability to have that experiential contact with it, which he says he doesn't have. Why is God an exception to this? Because he thinks he's got a proof, like a demonstration of like absolute certainty that God exists. Um, if you've got something like that, then you can know it. But for angelic beings, we don't have anything like that. Yeah. So, using the same thing, what about like something like radiation? Like, most of us have never probably experienced radiation, but we have like evidence of it through other people. So we don't know any like I don't. So under his definition, I don't know anything about radiation. So uh, about like high doses. Of course, we're like radiated every day, yeah. like our computer screens, the sun. And, uh, but you mean like high doses of like gamma rays or something? Um. He might be inclined to say if you have not had the direct experience of it, then you don't know it. Um, that you just have a very high probability of it. Um, so a lot of things you learn in science and history books and things, I guess, you don't, on his view, you don't know. Um, but once again, he'd, he'd be comfortable saying, but you know it with a high degree of probability. Mm -hmm. You know, like... I've never like met like Barack Obama personally, so I don't. Does that mean I don't? But then, what if I like know someone who has? Yeah. Or I know them, and they <laughs> know he exists. So can I like? I don't think that he's gonna let you piggyback off other people's knowledge. But <laughs> if we can get the TV screen to work, then you can know. It. Okay. Or yeah. Um. Two last things in this part. One of them, so he's going to talk about our knowledge of two different kinds of propositions. So the first kind are affirming the existence of an idea, and what he means by this is our knowledge of particular things. Our knowledge that, you know, this book exists, or that, um, you know, 
I am wearing this shirt or whatever. It's a knowledge of something in particular, not of anything general or universal. So he says, all of our knowledge of the existence of particular things comes through experience. Big surprise. Um, the bigger thing for us to think about has to do with our knowledge of universal or general things. Our agreement or disagreement of our abstract ideas and their dependence with one another. That's what he says. A nice way to put that is just the way that our general concepts, our universal ideas, truths that have to do with them. Like we say, all bachelors are unmarried. You know, all instances of, of red are instances of color. Um, all squirrels are mammals. Those are all universal ideas. So, if you're Locke, when you make any of those kinds of universal claims, here's one thing you need to be worried about. First of all is you don't experience all of them. I say all squirrels are mammals. Do you know that? Well, you don't experience every single squirrel. Uh, if I say all bachelors are unmarried, you haven't experienced every single bachelor. So how do we have knowledge about those things? Because he thinks we do know them. And it has to do by reflecting on those ideas. And through that process of reflection, we can sort of abstract the essential components and then see certain general truths that will hold for all of them. So the example that he gives is maybe a difficult one, but this is what he says. The example that he thinks is a universal truth is that God is to be feared and obeyed by humans. So Locke thinks that just by reflecting on the nature of human beings, reflecting on the nature of God, and reflecting on the nature of what it means to be feared and obeyed, that it would follow just by understanding those concepts from that we derive from particulars, that we can see that it's universally true that God is to be feared and obeyed by humans, generally speaking. Maybe a better example would be, once again, to think about our squirrels. Um, squirrel, all squirrels are mammals. That is something that is a universal truth we can know because just based off of our particular experience of squirrels and our particular knowledge of each individual mammal, we can extrapolate that all squirrels are like this and all mammals are like that. Therefore, all squirrels are mammals. Um, he talks about stuff, this <coughs> idea of what he calls eternal truths and this is because this is what they were called in his time. Things like all, for all triangles, the interior angles add up to two right angles. He, he, want, he says we can call these, these eternal truths if you like, but uh, because whenever they are formed, they must be true. But he doesn't think that these ideas exist in someone's mind eternally. Uh, after all, that's the, just the sort of thing that those rationalists who believe in innate ideas would say. So he doesn't want to give aid and comfort to them. And that's essentially it for this reading on 4.11 to 4.15. There are questions about anything else in this part. So in summary, this is the big stuff with Locke. He is an empiricist. You go all the way back, he rejects the existence of innate ideas. He doesn't think that reason is an original source for the ideas that we possess. Um, he thinks all of our ideas come through experience and that experience furnishes us with all of our ideas through sensation and reflection. Substances, if you remember that little bit we did on substances, are unclear ideas. We don't know what substances are, but we have to believe they exist. The problem of free will can be resolved by clarifying our terms and reframing the issues through those terms. Personal identity is a matter of having the same consciousness, and then knowledge does not require absolute certainty and extends only to the present testimony of the senses. Whew. Any questions about any of this lock stuff before we lock it up? We've got more puns. Um, 
then let's take another break here and let's come back when the clock says 735.